Venerable religious and dear parishioners, the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is one of the most beautiful, most rich, most profound devotions that we have in the Catholic Church, and it is absolutely theological and powerful in its, in its meaning. And today, as we celebrate the Feast of the Sacred Heart, we are reminded of so many things. We are reminded that God became man. And we can't meditate on that enough. I literally believe that. We cannot meditate on enough on that fact, that dogma, that Almighty God came down from heaven. It was not all three persons. It was the second person of the Blessed Trinity who came down to earth and became one of our human race. And that shows the incomprehensible love for God, of God for his human creatures. Why would he love his human creatures so much that had offended him, that had hurt him, that had turned their backs on him? God must be in love with his human creatures. He didn't take on an angelic nature. He didn't redeem the angels who fell, but he did redeem fallen man, and he became one of them. So what does that mean? It means that he has, that he took on a human body and a human soul. We call this the incarnation. We also call it the hypostatic union, that a divine nature was joined to a human nature, body and soul, and fused into one person, not two persons, as the heresy of Nestorianism declared. One person, two natures. And since he has a body, he has a heart. And our Lord's entire human body and soul are adorable in the fullest sense of the word because that human body and soul are united substantially to his divine nature. Just as our soul permeates every part of our body, so our Lord's divinity permeates every part of his human soul and of his human body. So therefore, his human heart is adorable in the literal sense of the word. Our Lord's entire human person, human nature, part of his divine person, entirely adorable. So there's so much to reflect upon today. It's an ocean of reflection, a limitless ocean of reflection. What does it mean, the doctrine of the sacred heart? And we know that our Lord's heart is not only adorable in and of itself, but it is also very powerful symbolically because do we not use the heart as the symbol of love? Well, and when we talk about speaking earnestly, we say somebody's speaking from the heart. Or to say that somebody's in somebody's heart is to express love for that person. So Almighty God already loved us infinitely as God before the incarnation. And from the very first moment of his conception, very first moment of the incarnation, now he began to love us as man as well. The doctrine of the sacred heart was never invented in recent centuries. When we look at the revelations of our Lord to St. Margaret Mary, we must not think that that was a new devotion. It always was from the first moment of the incarnation. And we see references to the 
devotion to the sacred heart in scripture itself. We read in today's gospel how the soldier opened his side. Notice the use of words that St. John, John uses in describing that. He didn't say he you know, rammed the, the spear into the side of our Lord. And why did the centurion do that? Because he didn't want to break our Lord's legs. And he, he was thinking, we need to see if he really is dead. And nobody can live with a you know, pierced side. So the soldier, we believe his name was Longinus, took the spear and he pierced, he went right in and pierced our Lord's heart. That is so profound. Because the last few drops, you might say, of blood were in the heart of our Lord. From all of his multiple wounds, he had bled to death. Not just was asphyxiating on the cross, but literally bleeding to death through multiple, multiple wounds. And we can say then that our Lord gave his last drops of blood for us because the heart was pierced. And he says, St. John, that blood and water came out. What is this water? Well, doctors tell us that there is a, a sac that encloses the heart called pericardium, and it has a clear fluid, or it is a clear fluid in, in that, that, that surrounds the heart. So when the heart was pierced, it looked like not just the blood coming out, but water, the, 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 the fluid that was around our Lord's heart. This is also so interesting in the Mass. You notice... In the offertory, the servers bring up water, or rather wine and water, and the priest is supposed to put a few drops of water into the wine. Very powerful reminder of the blood and water coming out of our Lord's side. So our Lord gave us all, not just in the metaphorical or... or uh, or a sense of life, he literally gave his all, the, all of his blood for us. And it was through the wound in the heart. And when our Lord rose from the dead, he kept that wound. Miraculously, who can live with a hole in his heart? Nobody. But miraculously, Jesus will live for all eternity with that gaping wound in his heart. Not only that, his feet, his hands and feet, as we are told by Scripture as well. He told Thomas, bring here thy finger, put it into my wounds, put it into my sight, put it into my hands, and be not faithless, but believing. Why did our Lord keep these five wounds? Why, I should say, why will he keep them for all eternity? where the saints and the angels behold them for all eternity. Wouldn't you think that if he rose from the dead, there would be not a scar, not a, not a trace of wounds left in his glorified body? But he deliberately chose to keep those five wounds. Not just so Thomas could put his finger into them, but that we would know that we have a refuge in those wounds. Spiritually, take refuge in his heart. Take refuge in his hands, his feet, in a spiritual sense. They're open. There's no door blocking us out. They are open, especially the wound in the heart. It's open. For you to go in there and partake of his love. So it's a continuous miracle. And of course those are the proofs of his love which he wants to bear for all eternity. 
and they remind us of the spiritual refuge that we have here on earth. I came across a book on, by uh, Meditations of, of a Priest on the Litany of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and I hope to get it reprinted because he gives many pages of reflection on each of the invocations of the, of the Litany of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and just want to r- briefly touch upon the first three. Heart of Jesus, Son of the Eternal Father. Remember how much the Father loved us that he sent his Son to die. Now the the Heavenly Father doesn't have a human heart, but his Son does. And his Son, when he became incarnate, he began to experience everything that we feel in our emotions, especially what is symbolized by the heart. We suffer in the heart. We've, don't we have that phrase to be heartbroken when the worst things have happened in our lives? We say, "My, I was heartbroken when that happened. Pope St. Pius X, same one, the same saintly pontiff who established the Diocese of Spokane and assigned its first bishop, they say he died of a broken heart when World War I broke out. It's a phrase we use to show how, how much our heart is, is, is where, what, what we feel and what we suffer inside. And the heart of the son felt the cost, the pain, the, the, the suffering that would be entailed by his becoming man. And we'll never grasp this love fully. The love of the Father and the love of the Son. The love of the Father condemning his Son to death for his human creatures. Heart of Jesus, formed by the Holy Ghost in the Virgin Mother's womb. Modern science tells us things that could have never been known centuries before. And we're told by modern science that the human heart begins to beat some three weeks after conception. It's it's detectable. So it's very powerful when we say the Holy Ghost formed the heart of Jesus in his mother's womb at the incarnation. And think of this. From the time of the incarnation till Jesus died on the cross, that heart was beating just like ours is. What happens if your heart were to stop beating? You'd die within minutes. Our heart beat all through the night. Last night, we didn't think about it. But thank God it didn't stop. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here this morning. We'd be dead. The heart has to beat. And it stopped on the cross. Stop. Not that he he stopped loving us, but the heart literally died with the body. And at the resurrection, the sacred heart began to beat again. And it will never stop beating for the rest of eternity. It's beating right now in his glorified state. We talk about somebody's heart beating for love of somebody else. Well, the sacred heart is beating for love of his human creatures and will always be for all eternity. It will never come to an end. Heart of Jesus substantially united to the word of God. As I said earlier, two natures refused into one person at the incarnation. We can't think about that enough. And that sacred heart becomes part of us for some 15 minutes when we receive Holy Communion. Never forget the story of the little boy on his first Holy Communion day. He was seen feeling his chest after Holy Communion. And he told his mother later, he says, I felt two two hearts beating in there. Now we probably won't feel that. A miraculous occurrence probably for that little boy, but it's true that we have 
the sacred heart beating within us for 15 minutes or so. We're going to make a solemn act of reparation today after Mass. Again, the words of Pope Pius XI, because as he put it so poignantly, he said, Christ the King has been dethroned from society. You know, that idea of absolute separation of church and state where there can't be any mention of God, that is an absolute dethroning of our Lord. When he is denied and his church is denied. And I don't know of a country left in the world. Literally, that's how bad it is. I don't know of a country left in the world that will properly adore and acknowledge Christ the sacred heart of Jesus as its king. It used to be Catholic countries would do that. They would, of course, not persecute ever. It shouldn't persecute non-believers. But at least the, the official religion was the Catholic religion, which means that Christ is being acknowledged and his church is being acknowledged. And the head of state, the government, would would make that act of consecration to the sacred heart of Jesus. We acknowledge thee that thou art king, not only in the spiritual realm, but thou art king in our realm as well, our temporal realm. That's the way it should be. But he has been dethroned. That's the sad reality. And we can't enthrone Jesus as head of government of the United States of America. We wish we could, but we don't have that power. But at least we can offer reparation by our presence, our prayer, our love, our sacrifice for his being dethroned. And we can make and need to make reparation for all the, probably the majority of mankind have dethroned him in their hearts. He's not the king of their hearts. Other things have taken that place. But at least we can say today and every day of our lives, Jesus, thou art the king of my heart. O Mary, thou art the queen of my heart. And I make this solemn profession. We told Jesus when we were baptized that he would be the king of our hearts. That's what our baptismal vows mean. And we renew that today. We can renew that often. Let's renew it in every Holy Communion. Jesus, thou art the king of my heart. Help me to love thee more, to love Mary more, and help me to love my neighbor more as thou didst teach us to love one another as thou hast loved us. So at least let us do that. And as a parish, we can do that. And just offer to Jesus the desire and the wish that one day the world and our country will cast off the shackles of sin and corruption and turn again to the true king and true queen. May they reign, at least reign in our hearts through our fervent living of our faith and of our devotion to them. Let us say often in life, through our daily living of faith, what Father Mateo said just before he, was, he died as a martyr, with his arms outstretched, I believe, rosary in one hand and cross in the other, viva Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King, long live the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of his mother. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.